so what we're looking at today, the last two concepts related to statistics. Um, we just encourage you, after the quiz, you know, we had kind of mixed results on the quiz. Remember, this, these concepts having to do with probability, statistics, counting, these are totally different ways of doing math than algebra or trig or whatnot. So make sure that you're really focusing on the kind of problem solving that needs to be done uh, on the quiz. Some people were still having trouble with when to use com combinations versus permutations um, or just recognizing when to use certain strategies. Okay, and that's the stuff that as we go through problems, you need to make sure you are considering. Okay, so uh, just especially as we move forward, take note of those things. What, what strategy do we use in this circumstance? Or if we learn a strategy, what types of circumstances do we use it in? Okay, yeah, Lexi? I don't understand how... Like, logically, there are more options when you have a permutation than a combination. Well, permutation is when... When the order matters. Order does matter, so... so wouldn't it be... Like, wouldn't you have more for a combination? Because it doesn't even matter what the order is. Well, it doesn't matter what the order is, which means that, for example, ABC... ABC, BAC, CBA or here, C-A-B, C-B-A, um, B-C-A, I'm missing one here, A-C-B, there we go. If I were just talking about combinations, there would only be one combination. Why? Because all of these use the same three letters. So there's one combination of the letters A, B, C, but there are six permutations because different orders give us more possibilities. Okay? So, is, wait, so the order is matter. So a permutation, the, orders mat the order matters. You're always going to get, it's possible to have the same number of permutations as combinations. Okay, but, but, but for it, the most part, your permutations will be greater. It, yeah, you almost always have this more permutations than you will combinations. Okay. All right. So now we want to talk about the probability of independent events. Okay. Independent events. Again, we, we, we briefly mentioned the definition of what independent events are. They are events where the occurrence of one event has no effect on the occurrence of the other. Okay? Um, and, and here we have kind of the concept of are we replacing after we choose? Or are we not replacing? Okay? Or are the events totally unrelated to the point where if one happens and the other happens, they have no bearing on each other? Okay? Um, so, for example, if I pick a card and then roll a die, if I'm looking at the probabilities, those are two independent events. They're. Um, you know, what I roll on the die has no bearing on what card I'm going to pick out of the deck. Okay? So, that's kind of the idea with independent. If I am picking, if I'm just picking a card out of the deck and I pick one out and then I put it back in the deck and pick another card, I haven't changed the probabilities. Okay? Because I'm putting it back every time. Alright? So, each time, all the probabilities stay the same. And uh, that really is the kind of the defining characteristic of, of independent events, is that the probability of one thing happening will not be affected or will not affect the next thing 
okay? They stay the same every step, okay? Now, we're talking about the probability of independent events, then we're talking about the probability that both A and B will happen, okay? So here we have this notation, the probability of A and B, which you could also see as the probability of A intersect B, equals the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay? So if I have a 1 in 4 chance of picking out a diamond, and I have a 1 in 6 chance of rolling a 2, then the probability of picking a diamond and rolling a 2 is going to be 1 4th times 1 6th, 1 24th. Okay, we would multiply those together. Now, another thing that happens here is we might be repeating the same event. So for example here, I'm rolling two dice. What are, what's the probability of rolling an eight three times in a row? Okay, well think, think about our table. You remember what the probability of rolling an 8 is? Um, 5 out of 36, okay? So, 5 out of 36, that's the probability of rolling it. Now, I pick the dice up and I roll again. What's the probability of getting an 8? 5 out of 36. Yeah. So, the probability of rolling two of them in a row is going to be 5 times 5 over 36 times 36, okay? So I rolled twice, what's the probability of rolling an eight if I roll again? Five out of 36, okay? So the probability of getting it three times in a row is gonna be five thirty-sixths cubed, okay? If we have a repeated event, okay, and each time is independent, then we can just raise that probability to whatever power it is. That'll tell us how many times, what's the probability of getting that many in a row? Okay, yes? Would that be a final answer? Uh, no, you would want to actually calculate it. It'd be 125 over something. 46,656. 656? Yeah. Okay, and then that ends up being... What is it, like one point, or point, no, point zero zero two seven. Okay, zero zero two seven. Okay, so, so that would be point two seven percent. Okay. By the way, when you're giving answers, make sure you give, you know, don't round it too much. Okay, three significant figures is preferred. Okay, like I don't know what this, did this come out to 0. 0.27 yeah. something? This is 0. 0.269, or 2689. 2689? 2679. 2679? Yeah. So, so really 0.268 would be a better answer. Okay. To go three significant digits, significant figures. Okay. Yeah. Do you prefer percents or, or uh, fractions? I don't care. The only thing would be if it's a fraction, it needs to be reduced. Okay. okay. So. All right. Um, look at another example here. Okay. It says, in 2004, approximately 65% of the population of the United States was 25 years old or older. In a survey, 10 people were chosen at random from the population. What is the probability that all 10 were 25 years old or older? Now, question, is this independent? No. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because as you, take, as you pick people, you don't have to pick the same person again. So... You're decreasing the population size. 
Okay, we're decreasing the population size because we're taking someone out. Does anyone know about what the population in the United States is? It's over 300 million people. Is taking one person out going to impact our probability? No. No. Okay, and this is one thing, this is one thing that we do commonly when we're talking about independent events, all right, is... If the population is very large, we will assume independence, even though, technically speaking, there's some, you know, one millionth of a percent difference in the probability because we take someone out of the population, all right? But it's such a small change, it's insignificant, okay? Um, it's, and that especially occurs when we're given some kind of a statistic on a, on a, a whole population like this, okay? We have so many people that, you know, pulling one person out is not going to change the probability for the, what the next person is, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, this is something that people... People will say, well, I don't know how many people there are total, so I don't know how to calculate the next probability. We're going to assume independence because the population is so large that the change is insignificant. Okay? Yeah. At what point do we assume independence? You mean like as far as the number of people? Yeah. In general, you'll have a situation like this where you know there's a large population, but you don't know what the number is. Like, in order for us to treat this as independent, we would need to know the exact number of people in the United States. Okay? So, obviously that, we don't know that. Um, so that that's one aspect of it. You know, if we had 600 people, then yeah, we could treat that as an independent kind of situation, because we know exactly how many there are, so we could calculate, okay, our chances for the next one are this, and the chances for the next one are this. But here we don't have a number, so it's so huge we assume independence, okay? So how would we calculate the probability that all 10 of the people we picked were over 25? 0.65. Yeah, 0.65. To the 10th power, okay? That's the probability that all 10, all 10 are um, over 25, okay? And what does that one come out to? Uh, 0.0135. Okay. All right, so 1.35%. Okay, 1.35% chance that all 10 people we picked would be, would be 25 years old or older, okay? Now, like I said before, we don't have to use events that are repeated events, but that is a very common application here. Yeah, Ellie? Um, how did you know that you have to do 0.65 to the 10th power? Um, because our independent, the rule for independence says that if events are independent, you take the probability of the one times the probability of the other. So, what we're really doing here is, think of it in terms of picking people. We pick our first person, the probability is 0.65. We pick our second person, an independent event, and it's 0.65 as well. And then we keep doing that for all 10 people, okay? I'm going to run out of room, so we'll do that. So you're picking all 10 people. So that's why we have the 10th power, okay? Good question. Now, let's make a connection with something we've done in the past. What was the first half of Chapter 8? that we did a number of months ago. Sequences in series and binomial, binomial expansion. expansion, okay? Oh no, we can skip the next slide. 
So this gives us, there's actually something called the binomial probability theorem, okay? The binomial probability theorem applies to situations where we have repeated independent events with, it's a binomial, so we have with only two possible outcomes. Okay? Now, even if a situation may have more than two possible outcomes, we could look at it as, a, as two possible outcomes by looking at one and then the complement. All right? So, for example, maybe... Uh, 20, age 25 and older was just one category, and we had like age 0 to 10 and 10 to 20 and 21 to 25, you know. But we could look at the situation as a binomial situation if we considered over 25 or under 25, the complement, okay? Um, but basically, if you recall... The binomial theorem, the binomial expansion, allowed us to take a binomial and raise it to a power using Pascal's triangle and the pattern for our exponents. Okay? Now, in this case, we could have 0.65 plus, what's the complement? 0.35. 0.35. Okay, because they add up to one. Now, so really we're just raising one to a power, right? So in the end, the whole thing ought to equal one, one all right? But what we're interested in more is the terms in the expansion. And watch this, this is why, okay? In our binomial theorem, we had 10 combination zero, and then we had the first term, okay, 0.65 in this case, to the 10th power times 0.35 to the 0 power. Remember the binomial theorem? It started at 0, and then 10, and yeah, okay. And then plus... 10 combination 1, 0.65 to the 9th times 0.35 to the 1st, okay? So it's almost like 0.35 is no, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, yeah. not 10 combination 1. Or is it still 10 combination 1? It's still 10 combination 1. Okay. So right, we're on the 10th row of Pascal's triangle, so they were all 10, choose 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to choose 10. I don't okay. understand why you use the complement. That's just what this theorem calls for us to do. We have to have we have to have something that only has two outcomes, so we can choose an outcome oh, and so its complement. Like in the sixty-five percent or not? Yeah. The total will be one. So yeah, the total yeah it'll be one. Now look at this. We we keep going. We keep adding all these up. Okay. And, you know, eventually we'll get down to, you know, in the middle somewhere we'll have a 10 choose 6. And that'll mean we have a 0.65 to the 4th and a 0.35 to the 6th. And then if we keep going, the very last term is going to be a 10 choose 10. The 0.65 will be to the 0 power now, and the 0.35 is to the 10th power. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, watch this. Okay? What we found up here is actually this first term. Okay? Now, one distinction here is 
In the binomial probability theorem, it's not going to tell us how many we could get in a row. For that, we would still have to do it like this. Okay, but obviously if we got all 10, that's 10 in a row. Okay? But what, look, 9 right here means that if we pick 9 people, what's the pro or if we pick 10 people, what's the probability that 9 of the 10 are 25 or older? Okay, 9 of the 10 are 25 or older, okay? So this term by itself will give us that probability, okay? Oh, okay. This term down here, okay, right here, this will give us the probability that we get 4 of the 10. Now, not necessarily 4 in a row, like our first problem was, but 4 of the 10 would be greater than or equal to 25. Could you ever use permutations? No, you wouldn't use permutations. This would always be combinations. Okay. Yes? Why don't you just multiply the point, like part of the binding 9 people will change this be 26 by to the 9th, because you just... Well, that would be the probability of getting all nine in a row. The first, that, if we did 0. 0.65 to the ninth power, that would be the probability of the first nine people we picked all being greater than 25. When we do this, this provides a greater probability than that because um, we don't care if they're all nine in a row. We just want nine out of the ten people we picked. So it is a little bit different than the first example we did, but but uh, but this is what that bi binomial probability does. Okay, I'm not going to do a ton with this, but it's something that in SL2 we'll work with a lot more. But I want to make the connection here because here's something we did way back in October, and now we're connecting it to stuff we're doing now. Okay, so. Um, but it's kind of interesting, and, and you can do, you can use this to find, hey, what's the probability of getting at least 7 out of the 10? And that's where you could add up multiple terms to get 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, or all 10 out of 10. You know, you can use it a lot of different number, a lot of different ways. Okay. All right, so... There's our little connection to the binomial probability theorem, right? But the whole point here is these are all independent events where the probability of one does not have an impact on the probability of the other, okay? Now, our last concept I want to look at in probability is when they do impact the others, okay? Now, you can do conditional probability with independent events, but it ends up being kind of trivial. Um, so conditional probability is what we're looking at. We're looking at the probability of something happening given that something else already happened. You know, for example, if I were rolling two dice, and I rolled the first one and looked at what it is, and let's say it was a 5, then I could say, okay, given that, what's the probability my total ends up being 7, seven or whatever, okay? Yeah. So you're, you kind of, uh, you have to look at it in light of what already happened, okay? It's kind of an interesting thing. I'll, I'll encourage you, this is not in your book. Okay, this is not in your book, um, so pay extra special attention, and you might want to write down maybe a little more than you might normally write down to, to take note of things, simply because it's not covered in your book. Also, on the homework, I'll upload the PDF here like I normally do, but at the end... There are some problems that I put in here 
from another source that deal with conditional probability. Again, they're not in your book, so you'll have to look at the PDF to get those for the homework. Okay? But let's talk about what conditional probability is, some notation that you'll need to be familiar with, and there's a little formula. Okay? So, given two events, A and B, the conditional probability of A given B is the probability that A occurs given that B has already occurred. Okay? Now, notice the notation here. We have A and then this vertical line followed by a B. That means A given B. B has already happened. B has already happened. So the second one really already happened. Okay. Now, here's a, a formula, and you'll notice we've already learned how to calculate the different parts of this formula. Um, it says the probability of A given B equals the probability of A intersect B, or A and B, over the probability of B. Okay? One easy way to remember the formula is that here we're talking about the probability of both, we have the and, over the probability of what we're given. Okay? The probability of both over the probability of the given. Okay, so when we're working with these, there are two kind of tools that can be helpful. One is a Venn diagram. One is a, um, a tree diagram. Okay, so a Venn diagram and tree diagram. If you're given all the data in a table broken down by categories or something, it actually is a really easy concept. You don't even really need to think about the formula at that point. Just think about what you're getting. Okay? Um, but let's look at an example where a Venn diagram would be helpful. Okay? We have here, we're talking about food preferences. Okay? In a class of 25 students, 14 like pizza and 16 like iced coffee. Now, if you look at that, that adds up to 30. We only have 25 kids, right? So, something's up. All right? So, it says one student likes neither, and six students like both. Okay? So, we're asked, one student is randomly selected from the class. What's the probability that the student likes pizza, or likes pizza given that he or she likes iced coffee? All right? So let's, let's look at this here. First of all, let's fill out the Venn diagram. We'll call this the pizza circle, and this is the coffee circle. Okay? Um, it says one student doesn't like either one. Where do they end up? Outside. Outside both circles. Okay? They get left out. Okay? They're always the, they're the difficult one. Okay? Anyways, um, it says six students like both. So where does that go? In the middle. Okay. Here's our six. So, how many students go here? Subtract six. Subtract six from the fourteen, right? So we have eight. Okay. And notice, these are the students that only like the pizza. Here are the students who like both. Here are the ones who only like the pizza. So we also need to fill in how many ten. students only like the coffee. Ten. That's ten. Okay? So, now, once you have your Venn diagram, double check, because how many students do we have total? Twenty-five. 25. So we have six plus ten is sixteen, plus eight is twenty-four, plus one is twenty-five. Okay? If you don't end up with the right number, then you did something wrong in there. So, what then is the probability 
that we like pizza. There's 14 students out of 25 total who like pizza, so 14 25ths. Okay? Now, part B here, what's the probability, notice the notation here, what's the probability that they like pizza given that they like iced coffee? Okay? See how the Venn diagram is really helpful, all right? If, we're, if it's given that we know they like a iced coffee, we know we're in this circle right here, right? Yeah. So we don't care about the rest of these. We're just looking at them. So if you think about it, what the given does is it kind of narrows our population down to a subset of the population. We're just looking at the ones who like, like iced coffee. So what's the probability they like pizza? 6 over 10, okay, or 6 over 16, sorry, 6 out of 16, which is 3 eighths, or 37 and a half percent, okay? Now, let's say we don't have a nice Venn diagram, we need to actually figure out what that is. Let's use the formula, okay? The formula, probability of both over probability of the given, right? So probability of pizza and coffee over probability of liking coffee. So what's the probability of both here? Six out of 25. Six 25ths is our probability that any student will like both. If it's just coffee, six Oh, okay. Yeah, we're doing the numerator. So the probability of both is our intersection. That's 6 out of 25 students. Okay? What's the probability that someone likes coffee? 16. 16 out of 25. There we go. Okay? And then notice when we reduce, the 25s cancel out. And we have 6 over 16. Is it always going to be like that? Or like, it's a fake number, I guess, cross it up? Uh, as long as you don't reduce first, yeah. Okay. A lot of times, though, you'll be given probabilities that are already reduced. So you'd have to flip and multiply, but that's why they cancel out. When you flipped it and multiplied yeah, yeah. it, you'd have a 25 on top and bottom. All right, so there's how we get our 6 sixteenths, which takes us up to here, and we get 3 eighths from that. Okay? Any questions? Comments? Anything? All right. Another tool that can be useful... Hold off on that one. Um, yeah, let's do that. Another tool that can be useful is a tree diagram. Okay? Hopefully, this doesn't crash on me. Microsoft has the blue screen of death, and we got the pinwheel of death. Yep, we're we're gone. Let's try this again. Patience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's try this here. Yeah. 
Here we go. Do I want to recover files? Yes. It'll be on Skyward. Yeah, I'll put it on there. What? Okay, here we go. Ah, good. Here we go. So here's our situation. Again, this is kind of a silly situation, but you'll get the idea. Uh, the top shelf in a cupboard contains three cans of pumpkin soup and two cans of chicken soup. The bottom shelf contains four cans of pumpkin soup and one can of chicken soup. All right. Lucas is twice as likely to take a can from the bottom shelf as he is from the top shelf. Suppose Lucas takes one can of soup without looking at the label. Determine the probability that it, A is chicken or B was taken from the top shelf given that it is chicken. Okay? So this is one where a tree diagram would be helpful. Okay? So we need to construct a tree diagram. We need to consider our two possibilities here. Okay? We need to consider, first of all, um, which shelf it came from, okay? Oh. What were you doing? Go ahead. <laughs> Just teach, I was teaching. Teach us some math. Okay, so which shelf does it come from? So we have either the top or the bottom. Now, what is the probability of the top shelf? One half. One third. Uh, one, third. one third. Why one third? Yeah, one. Chicken. Mm -hmm. And then one half. One half. It's it's one half. One half. half. There's, two, there's two shelves you can pick from. Yeah, he says he's twice as likely. One third. So it's one third and two thirds. One third and two thirds. It's one third. And two thirds. So here's the thing a little bit of proportional looking at. All right, listen. It says, listen. Be quiet and listen. It says he's twice as likely. So whatever the probability of, hitting, of reaching the top is, X, he's twice as likely. To choose from the bottom one, right? But why is it over three? Well, look, because he only has two choices, so if I add up these two probabilities, it has to equal one, right? Yeah. X and X is 3X, divide by 3. So the probability of choosing the top is one-third. The probability of choosing the bottom is two-thirds, okay? Then we have to consider which kind of soup. Okay, I've never had pumpkin soup, but whatever. Okay, so look at the top. The top shelf has three cans of pumpkin soup, two cans of chicken soup. So what's the probability that he picks pumpkin off the top? Three fifths. Three fifths, okay. The probability of chicken is? Two fifths. Two fifths, okay. Should add up to one. But what if he picks the bottom shelf? He could get, again, pumpkin or chicken soup. What's the probability of pumpkin? Four fifths. One fifth. Okay. So, let's think about this, okay? For each of these ends of the tree diagram, I have the probability of an intersection, the top shelf and pumpkin. I have the probability of the top shelf and chicken, right? Here I have the probability of the bottom shelf and pumpkin. And here I have the probability of the bottom shelf and chicken. And what am I going to do to calculate each of these? Multiply. These are independent, right? 
Are they independent? Yes. 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 No. No. Yes. no. No, they're not. The first step is independent. The, it's, the next it's, step con- it's conditional. Oh, the first step... Doesn't really count. Doesn't really count, yeah. But yeah, it's not just the back. You're talking just the back. Are we... Are, well, that would be if we're picking the can and picking it like more than one can. That would, That's where we would consider putting it back or whatever, okay? It's conditional. This is, yeah, this is not independent. We can't just multiply and say, hey, our probability of getting um, top shelf and pumpkin soup is whatever, okay? Um, all right, so... Let's look at this, okay? First of all, we want the probability that we get chicken, okay? Now, the probability that we get chicken here, okay, we can go ahead and multiply one-third times two-fifths, okay? Two fifteenths. All right. The probability that we get chicken down here. Two fifteen. We multiply two thirds times one fifth, and we get two fifteenths. So what's the probability that we get chicken at all? Four fifteenths. No, four. Four fifteenths. Okay. These are mutually exclusive. I can't get chicken from the bottom shelf and get chicken from the top shelf at the same time with one draw. Okay? All right, we'll pick up there tomorrow. Yeah.